All right, welcome into another day of your daily Devo. Pastor Rick here, and we are jumping into Hosea chapter 8. And so we're over the halfway mark. We're, we're on the downhill. We're on the downhill slope here. And so hoping to pick up some momentum and uh, learn some lessons and grow from, from what God wanted to teach uh, the Israelites for sure, but also wanted to teach us. So that's why he had it recorded in the Bible, because it says that all of these things were written for our example. All of these things. It's, it's really good and important to remind ourselves <clears throat> that uh, though, even though sometimes the Old Testament might be a little bit of a struggle to understand, is that God put it there for a reason for us to learn from and to grow from. And so because you all you often find like I, I know that my gut reaction a lot of times is to want to like kind of judge, kind of judge those crazy Israelites. And like, really, are you kidding me now? Like that's that's how you responded in that situation. Like, oh, you of little faith, you know, but, but as I get to know myself better, <laughs> as I, ugh, you know, as I've seen more of my own track record, I go, you know what? Um, I think I'm a little bit more like the Israelites than I like to give myself credit for. Uh, I struggle in many of the same ways. I, I do a lot of the same things. I fall into some of the very same traps. So let's go ahead and let's jump in to uh, chapter eight. It's about uh, 14 verses long. So put the trumpet to your mouth. One like an eagle comes against the house of the Lord because they transgress my covenant and rebel against my law. So that's a couple of things that they're doing. They tr transgress my covenant. They rebel against my law. So just kind of describing what's going on there. But Israel cries out to me, my God, we know you. But Israel has rejected what is good. So an enemy will pursue him. So it's this weird place that the Israelites find themselves in. Transgressing the covenant, rebelling against his law, yet crying out to him, my God, we know you, you know, but is the knowing genuine if it doesn't change what's going on here in your heart? If the knowing God doesn't begin to change your behavior, you have to start to ask yourself, do, do I actually know him? Do I actually have a relationship with him? And that's what God wants us to have with him is a relationship with him, not just mental assent that, yes, I believe in you because the Bible tells us that even the demons believe that God exists. But clearly believing in God does not represent enough to get you to get you across the finish line. <laughs> like like the demons believe that God exists and they're still, you know, heading for eternal judgment. So Israel cries out to me, "My God, we know you." Israel has rejected what is good and an enemy will pursue him. They have installed kings, but not through me. They have appointed leaders, but without my approval. They have made their silver and gold into idols for themselves for their own destruction. So here we have like man-made leadership. We, they've installed kings, but not through God. They've appointed leaders but not with, uh, not with God's approval. And they've gone on then to make silver and gold or money, riches, wealth into idols for themselves that end up being their own destruction. So your calf idol is rejected Samaria. That's the capital of the, of the, the kingdom of Israel there in the north. Your calf idol is rejected, Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? I mean, it's just so critical for us to take into account these kinds of verses. This is not, this is not whoops-a-daisy accidental sin and like you just, you know, ask for forgiveness and move on kind of thing. No, this is like heart the heart uh, direction, you know, like pointing your heart in the opposite direction of God because you want to have nothing to do with him. That's that's the kind of like rebellion 
that we're talking about in this situation. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want anybody like involved in sin on a day in and day out basis. But at the same time, if you get this idea in your head that if you make one little tiny mistake, that God's anger is going to burn against you, I think that would be an improper understanding of God's judgment towards sin, his anger towards sin. Um, you can see that they were doing all kinds of things wrong. Like a point they, their appointed leader, they appointed leaders, but without his approval, they didn't ask him. They installed Kings, but they didn't ask him because they're rejecting him, rejecting him, rejecting him, rejecting him. The calf of Samaria will be uh, smashed to bits. For, for this thing is from Israel. <laughs> How long will they be incapable of innocence in verse 6? For this thing is from Israel. A craftsman made it. And it is not God. The calf of Samaria will be smashed to bits. A craftsman made it. It's not God. You know, like, it's crazy that they're trying to manufacture their own God. Then verse seven says, indeed, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. So it's like, it's, it's, you know, one, one version of that, you know, uh, Chicago, the, the windy city. Um, they're like, well, a lot of times it's not even that windy there. So why in the world do they call it the windy city? Well, one, one report of where that name comes from, it's cause they have lots and lots of politicians in Chicago and, they uh, talk a lot. And so that was one of the angles of why it was called the Windy City. It's because so many politicians and all their hot air, <laughs> all their all the blowhards, I don't know. <laughs> so um, indeed, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind, which is uh, kind of a picture of divine judgment. The whirlwind is. There's no standing grain. What sprouts fails to yield flour. Even if they did, foreigners would swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. Now they are among the nations. They have, they've rejected God. They've kind of like left the Lord's camp, so to speak. And now they're just among the nations, like discarded po uh, pottery. They have gone up to Assyria. Again, crazy talk. Why are we going to Assyria? Like a wild donkey going off on its own. Like how well do you think that ever works out for any donkey that just decides to go wander out on his own? And that's the kind of picture that God gives us when we are trying to leave, avoid, run away from what God wants us to do. It's like a wild donkey going off on its own. And then it says Ephraim has paid for love, even though they hire lovers among the nations, I will not round them up. They will begin to decrease in number and under the burden of the king and leaders. And so here Ephraim is trying to pay for love. And what you find when you pay for love is you have no love and now you have no money. And it's kind of the deal with sin in general. Like this is the way sin works in our hearts, but we can trick ourselves so easily into not grabbing a hold of that, not believing it. But that when you sin, it's like, it's like paying for love because you pay your money. Now you don't have any money, but you also don't have any love because paying money is not how you get it. So we want love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and uh, faith, can, f uh, faithful love and self-control. I, I, lost, I lost count there. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And I probably missed one, but it doesn't matter. It's all good. You know what I'm talking about. The fruit of the spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22, 23, 24, right in there. Like, that's what we want. And so when we pursue those things through worldly means, then we, we sow the wind and we reap the whirlwind because we're sowing things that don't have the seed of the kingdom of God in them. Even though they hire lovers among the nations, I will uh, now, I will now round them up. 
and they will begin to decrease in number under the burden of the king and leaders. So he's allowing them to like receive some of the consequences of their decisions. And when Ephraim multiplied his altars for sin, they became his altars for sinning. Though I were to write out for him 10,000 points of my instruction, they would be regarded as something strange. Though they offer sacrificial, sacrificial, though they offer sacrificial gifts and eat the flesh, the Lord does not accept them. And now he will remember their guilt and punish their sins. They will return to Egypt. Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. Don't do it, guys. Don't do it. Don't forget your maker. Don't leave him out there. Like, no, get, get there. Get into the presence of God. Hang out with God. Know God, like genuinely know God and allow him to transform your heart and your mind and then your actions. Judah has also multiplied fortified cities. I will send fire on their cities and it will consume their citadels. So one of the big lessons to learn here is Israel is trying to run from God, trying to abandon him, trying to get all the things that they've always needed that God promises to provide if they would just obey. But no, they don't want to do it on God's terms. They want to do it on their own terms. And this is one of those times where I really want to just sit back and just be like, y'all are crazy. Like, what are you thinking? And yet... When I look at my own life, I see times and situations where I do the exact same thing. Like if God's timing isn't quick enough or something, or I don't feel like I've gotten the answer that I wanted or I needed or whatever. We've got to do it God's way because that's what happened in the garden is because he said, hey, don't eat of the fruit of that one tree. I fully believe he intended for them to eat from that tree at some point, but I believe they needed to know him more first. So if they could have just hung on, you know, and gone through the process correctly, God could have brought them into the rest of the plan. Instead, they chose rebellion. They chose uh, animosity and uh, opposition towards God. And there we have sin. So it continues in the Israelites. It continues to some degree in you and me that we have those things that we think, I know how I could do this better. I know how I, could, I know how I could get there faster, Lord. Lord, you just don't know what you're talking about. Let's not be like that. Let's not be like that. Let's not be like how Israel is behaving in this one. Let's not be like wandering donkeys in the wilderness. Let's not be like broken, scattered pottery. Come on, let's, and let's certainly not be like those that spend our riches on prostitutes, looking for love in all the wrong places, as that famous poem said. <laughs> um, looking for love in all the wrong places and yet coming up empty every time. The fact of the matter is that God is love. God has a plan. God is good and he does good. So we need to turn our hearts afresh towards him. Be encouraged today. God bless you. I will see you tomorrow.